So welcome, everybody. It is very exciting to have you join us today. My name is Curry Sautner, and we are live in class on this amazing topic this week, all about the presidency. This week, we are talking about the presidency all week long, and today we have a special guest with us, Holly Frey. And, of course, we are going to be led with our conversation also with our um, CEO and president at the National Constitution Center, Jeff Rosen. Today's topic is going to look at the presidency, but also look deeply at the history and the building of the White House. So we get two great scholars today, two great discussions, and we're gonna get this all done all in a half an hour. So I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and my job today is to get the questions to Jeff all about the Constitution and the questions to Holly all about the building and the history of the presidency through the lens of the White House. If you have questions for me and want me to ask them, please put them in the chat or use the Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to first welcome Jeff Rosen. Jeff, would you like to say hi? Um, hi, everyone. And I would like to welcome Holly Frey. We're so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So Holly Frey has this amazing podcast that I am now super obsessed with called The Stuff You Missed in History Class. And Jeff Rosen does the podcast that I've been obsessed with for uh, years, the We the People podcast. So I thought, what a great way. There's so many ways to teach about American history and teach about the presidency. Let's bring one of my favorite ways, teaching through podcasts and the top big speakers on that here together. So as we go in this and we dive through this, we're going to look at, like I said, the foundation of the presidency through the Constitution and then the literal foundation of the president's house as well. So before we get into that, Holly, could you tell us a little bit more about the podcast that you do and kind of how you started it? Yeah, I um, I didn't actually start this podcast. I came into podcasting completely by accident. At the time, I was working as a copy editor for the website How Stuff Works, which used to be, uh, which is where Stuff You Missed in History class started. And I, one afternoon at a party, Tracy, who is my co-host on the show, and I were being a little bit snarky and our boss overheard us. And the next morning he called us in his office and we thought we were getting in trouble. But in fact, he said, I like your chemistry, you should have a podcast. And so we started a podcast together about pop culture actually. And at the same time, this show already existed. It had started in a much different format. Uh, it was originally called Fact or Fiction and it was short, it was like five minutes long. And it had evolved and had a lot of host changeover over time. But then when the prior two hosts, one left for another opportunity and the other decided she was just ready to step away because it is a lot of work. And so Tracy and I transitioned on to hosting Stuff You Missed in History class. And we kind of changed it up a little bit and made it our own. And we built on what had come before, but we also took the direction of doing a lot more extensive research and making a really big effort to capture the nuance of various historical events. And also to make sure to keep listeners aware that we don't count ourselves as experts. We're learning right along with them. We're exploring and finding the information and then sharing it. And it's been a real joy to be part of that experience for so many people. I, you just mentioned my other favorite thing, how stuff works, which I am obsessed <laughs> with and have been since forever, since I think the beginning of it. So there's like really exciting ways to learn about history and learn yeah. how stuff works. So with that perfect transition, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Rosen. And Jeff, this is perfect. Can you give us the how stuff works, the presidency, and how the presidency works by looking at the Constitution? So I know, and I, I love when you do this, I know you're going to want to screen share that interactive constitution. So let me make sure you can do that. Um, but can you walk us through the constitution, where the power of the presidency is, and where the, the duties of the president is, are as well? So we understand a strong foundation in the constitution, the role and job of the presidency from the constitutional lens. Absolutely. I'll just do it fast because we want to get to the great historical anecdotes, but the main powers of the president, as you said, Curry, are found in Article 2. And Article 2 is striking in that it has fewer explicit powers than Article 1, which grants powers to Congress, and which the framers thought would be the clause that created the most dangerous branch. They thought the presidency would be far more constrained by comparison. So Article 2 first has the vesting clause. It vests the executive power of the United States in a single president. 
It sets out the details for how we elect a president, namely through the Electoral College, and how we might remove a president from office through impeachment. And then it lists the president's core powers and responsibilities. And there are strikingly few. Uh, there's uh, the role as commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, but not the power to declare war, strikingly. And in addition to that, we have the take care clause, which allows the president to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. We have the power to appoint judges and executive branch officials with the advice and consent of the Senate. We have the power to make treaties if two thirds of the senators present concur. And we have the power to grant pardons and reprieves for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. That's the gist of it. There are other powers in other articles. Article one gives the, power, the president the power to veto legislation passed by Congress. Um, but I think that's a good place to begin. I think that's a great place to begin. Um, and as we dive into this, I know that one of our students already asked the question, um, can the president pardon themselves? Is that a possibility? So I just wanted to sneak that in there before we jump into the other questions I have for Holly. Sure, that's a great question. Uh, a senator asked that same question to Judge Amy Coney Barrett uh, yesterday or the day before during her Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Mm. Her response, I cannot answer that question because it has not yet come before the courts. And that's uh, a correct answer that no court has considered the question of whether a president can pardon him or herself, partly because no president has attempted to pardon him or herself before. We do know from the Constitution that the president can't pardon anyone uh, with regard to cases of impeachment. So if he were accused of an impeachable offense, he couldn't pardon himself or anyone else in ways that would stop an impeachment proceeding. Broadly, the arguments on two sides, and I'm kind of doing this on the fly because there haven't been briefs or arguments of the kind that Judge Barrett said she would need to make a careful decision. The argument in favor of self-pardons is that the pardoning power is unrestricted. It came from the monarchy, and it was kind of a vestige of the monarchical power, and the king had executive clemency to override the law because he or she, if it were a queen, uh, was the fount of all sovereignty. The argument on the other side is, in the United States, we the people are sovereign. The president isn't sovereign. The president is not a king. The president is subject to the rule of law. The Supreme Court said that in the Nixon tapes case. It said that in the subpoena cases last year by broad bipartisan majorities. And for the president to be able to pardon himself, this argument goes, would undermine his ability to be subject to ordinary laws and would put the president above the law. So that's a very quick effort uh, at answering a really deep question. And if any of you wants extra credit and you want to dig into some of the uh, crucial precedents about the scope of the pardoning power um, and write a little note to uh, Curry and me about what you've learned, we'd love to see it. I should warn Holly that we assign lots of homework in this class. <laughs> love it. I'll do it. It's, it's, fun. <laughs> it's extra credit and it's just purely for the pleasure of learning. Yeah, for fun for learning. Okay, so Holly, you yeah. know, this just gave us the foundation of the presidency. He gave us kind of the 101, here's the foundation. Can you do that same thing for us with your research on the White House? And again, I know I keep having puns in here and I'm sorry, I'm an uncontrollable punner, but <laughs> thinking about was the White House, so I, I have this beautiful backdrop on purpose today, but was the White House always in Washington, D.C.? What's the foundation and the history of the building that we so iconically connect with the executive branch and for so many really good reasons? Well, the White House itself, yes, has always been in D.C., but the residence of the president has not. Um, as you probably know, when George Washington was elected president in 1789, he was living in New York, and he actually stayed there for a while, and New York kind of wanted him to stay. Uh, there was even an executive mansion prototype built in New York to try to convince him. Philadelphia did a similar thing. But ultimately, this was an ongoing debate. Um, and Washington, D.C. is, of course, unique among American cities because it was established in the Constitution to serve as the capital. Uh, that was founded on July 16th of 1790, but it still had to be built. So there was a provision for Philadelphia to actually be a temporary capital for 10 years while that happened. And as to the location of the White House itself, uh, which didn't get that name for a bit, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, I think, um, 
this was a famous compromise, right? It resulted from a whole debate over where the nation's capital should be. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, representing Northern interests, wanted the new federal government to take on Revolutionary War debts. That was something not everyone agreed with. Thomas Jefferson and his representation of the Southern states wanted the capital to be placed somewhere that was friendly to the South. And so they ended up in this compromise position where they were like, you can have what you want if I can have this and you can have what this. And they worked it out. Both Maryland and Virginia ended up ceding land to create this unique district. Uh, it did take a full 10 years for the mansion to be livable. That foundation actually was started out in a place of change uh, where it, it was initially staked out by one architect. He was eventually... Uh, off of the project, whether that was through his intent or um, uh, government interests is something of a debate. But then another architect came on and he had to change around the foundation a little bit and set this up. And even in 1800, when the first residents, which were John and Abigail Adams moved in, it was not done. <laughs> they lived with construction basically the whole time they were there. Um, there are some very fun letters back and forth. One where Abigail Adams talks about like kind of the pressures and the difficulties of living in this half finished house, which she then says, please don't tell anybody I said this. I don't wanna seem ungrateful or ungracious. Uh, but yeah, they, they hung their laundry in the great room and they made do with a house that was not completed. So from the beginning, it's been a little bit less of a, an iconic, majestic finished structure than people might think. Then when you talk about Adams, um, and then I think about Jefferson being next in the White House, and I, I absolutely want you to tell us the story about Jefferson's opinions on the design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to make Jeff tell us the story about my favorite uh, most dramatic election of 1800. So could you just tell us a little bit about Jefferson's influence on the design, um, and then we'll roll into the Adams and Jefferson administration, which is another good line from the Hamilton musical. <laughs> yeah, the um, Thomas Jefferson really wanted to base everything about the White House and the grounds on French culture because he was really into French culture. And one of the things um, King Louis the Fourteenth is often credited with kind of the development of what we think of as iconic. French culture in terms of government, right? Versailles was built under him. And he was notoriously finicky about wanting to have his, his input on everything from where trees got put to where, you know, chairs were set. And Jefferson followed suit in every regard to the point that his, uh, his architect actually in his letters comments that he gets all of these crazy ideas from France and he doesn't know what he's talking about, but he won't let any of them go. So it was a little bit of a, a tense relationship, but he did a lot to change the grounds of the White House while he was there. Um, I think one of the things you say in the podcast that made me laugh so hard, you're like, isn't that so Jefferson? <laughs> uh, and, yes. and I was like, isn't that so, like so Abigail Adams not to complain and not right. to seem ungrateful? And isn't that so Jefferson to be like, I went the French influence in all this architecture. Yeah. Uh, now, Jeff, tell us a little bit more about the Adams to Jefferson administration change and the presidency and how it changes the constitution when we're looking at the election of 1800. That I feel is the foundational piece to understanding how the presidency works today. Absolutely. And the talk about John Adams in the White House and Holly's phenomenal description made me look up that famous letter that Adams sent to his wife, Abigail, uh, with a famous quotation that of course, Franklin Roosevelt um, required to be carved into the mantelpiece of the state dining room. And the quotation is, uh, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it, they none, may none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. And the quotation is famous, but I hadn't realized until looking up the letter that he wrote it to Abigail on November 2nd, 1800. So it must have been just before or maybe after, Holly can fill us in, the election of 1800, um, which as you said, um, Curry, resulted in a change in the constitution. So the election of 1800, uh, so important because it's the first time political parties are clashing. The Federalists led by John Adams, the Democratic Republicans led by Jefferson. And the election is incredibly close uh, because the uh, there's a tie in the um, 
House of Representatives, the way the Constitution worked at the time, electors are supposed to cast their uh, vote for president and vice president. Um, Jefferson and Aaron Burr are running from the same party, the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, the, uh, the electors are supposed to throw away one vote so that um, Jefferson and Burr don't tie, but they forget to do that. So Jefferson and Burr tie in the uh, Electoral College. The uh, uh, election goes into the House of Representatives and there, there are a whole bunch of ballots, but it takes um, a tie-breaking uh, vote by Federalists, including Alexander Hamilton, who decides to throw his weight behind uh, Jefferson and not Burr to ensure Jefferson's election. Burr is so angry at this that he fights the duel that kills uh, Hamilton. And as a result of that uh, complete uh, stalemate, uh, Congress proposes and the legislatures ratify the 12th Amendment, which ensures and uh, takes for granted the existence of political parties, ensures that the president and vice president cannot tie again and creates the mechanism for choosing the president that we have today. And so and there's so many kind of questions around the presidency and how it changes and moves. Um, and when we're thinking about adding amendments to change the um, presidency, we also jump to kind of two bigger, two big amendments, the 22nd and the 25th. So why we're on that about adding um, amendments to the constitution, can you real briefly go through those two amendments? Sorry, I'm going off script here. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Well, in that case, I think we are going to have to screen share the interactive <laughs> no, conversation. I've, I've been resisting doing it so far, but I'm really eager to show it to Holly too, because it's so exciting. And I hope that she'll share it with, with her listeners as well. So Holly, as our friends who are watching know, this is the interactive constitution. And it's just amazing free online tool because you can pick any amendment. I'm going to pick the 22nd as Curry asked. And you see the top liberal and conservative scholars in America with a thousand words about what they agree the amendment means and then separate statements about what they disagree. So here our scholars are um, F.H. Buckley and Jillian Metzger nominated by the Conservative Federalist Society and the Progressive American Constitution Society. And they talk all about um, what the amendment was designed to do. But we, well, let's see, what, what's gonna be uh, better? I think it'll be quicker rather than reading the text because the text is so, oh, oh, you wanted the 22nd. Okay, good. Well, let's have it. Um, basically, the, the text is fine because it essentially says no person shall be elected to the office of the presidency more than twice and no person who's held the office uh, for more than two terms uh, shall be elected more than once. What was going on here? Well, professors Buckley and Metzger tell us that the framers were concerned about the fact that Franklin Roosevelt broke the two-term tradition. President Washington decided to retire after two terms. He didn't have to. He could have been reelected almost for life because he was so popular, but he chose to relinquish power. And that tradition held until Franklin Roosevelt ran for and was elected to a third term in 40 and a fourth term in 44. And uh, as a result of that, uh, people in Congress decided to limit presidential terms according to the 22nd Amendment. And then quickly, Curry, you also wanted the 26th Amendment, and that's in the news now because some states have claimed that um, if you decide to grant the ability to cast mail-in ballots to older people because of COVID, you can't deny the same right to young people without violating the 26th Amendment. And so far, a district court has accepted that argument, but appellate courts rejected it and the Supreme Court has refused to weigh in. The 26th Amendment is, the text is really simple. The right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged because of age. Friends, if you're approaching 18 year old, uh, then you will be able to vote when you're 18, thanks to the 22nd Amendment. And uh, sorry, thanks to the 26th Amendment. And here are scholars, Jocelyn Benson and Michael Morley tell us why that was the case. And partly we learned it was because the Oregon and Mitchell case said that um, Congress has the authority to lower the voting age in federal elections, but can't do so for state and local elections. So you need a constitutional amendment to lower the voting age, which Congress is obviously trying to do. And that's what led to the proposal and ratification of the 26th Amendment. Awesome. So before, and I'm going to make us go back one more time, because there's one story that I want Holly to tell that it was absolutely fascinating, kind of 
to hear how it changed the White House so much. And, and then we'll get into the modern conversation around change in the presidency and change in the White House. But before we leave the colonial period fully, I wanted to talk about the, the Madison years um, and the Madison years in the White House and in particularly you know, the Dolly Madison story about the fire at the White House. Can you tell us a little bit about the Madison years in the White House and how things changed and then that fire that is so iconically one of these, what we all think of as these great moments in American history. <laughs> sad, sad and great, I should yes, say both. The fire so... is sad, but the story's great. Right, of course. While while uh, that presidency was happening, of course, the War of 1812 was underway. And in 1814, a lot of Washington, D.C. was burned, and that included the White House. Uh, British troops set it, as well as the surrounding area, completely ablaze. And the presidential mansion was basically gutted. I mean, it, it burned, leaving only the exterior walls. Uh, it would have probably burned to the ground had it not been for the fact that there was a storm surge that put the fire out. Um, and there are a couple of interesting myths that are associated with this event. One, you will hear the story and it's super charming, is that Dolly Madison uh, was so worried about the Gilbert Stewart portrait of George Washington that she, in a moment of desperation, cut it from its frame, rolled it up, put it under her arm and ran for the hills uh, to get out of the burning mansion. She did, in fact, protect that painting, though it's not quite that dramatic. She actually um, made sure that it had been taken down, securely covered, and was off in a carriage before she would uh, acquiesce to leaving the burning building herself. Um, there's also another interesting myth that comes about because of this. You will often hear all the time that that is the reason uh, that the White House got painted white, was that after it was rebuilt, that they painted it white to hide scorch marks. Probably white paint did help with some of the cosmetic damage. However, uh, it was painted white for the first time in 1798 during construction. Uh, that was because they needed to seal the stonework that they were doing because it was very, very porous and they didn't want the building to crumble as it went through the seasons and complete changes in cold and hot. So uh, it was more of an issue of the elements and not to hide fire damage. Although that story persists and it's charming, but not entirely accurate. But the, the coining of this is the White House, who does that come from? That is uh, Roosevelt in 1914, I believe, is when he, he officially decided. Uh, because it originally, in the plans that were originally made back when Washington was envisioning this, it was actually first called the Presidential Palace. And people were like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not emulating the European uh, setups that we have been trying to get away from. We want this to be a different kind of thing, and I am not a monarch. So then it became known by a number of different names, including the presidential residence and the executive mansion. Uh, and it wasn't until the early 1900s that it officially became the White House, although people had been calling it that the entire time. Very cool, very cool. Um, and so one of the things that as like we're teaching this class this week, we're diving into the interactive constitution, and I went, I was listening to your podcast multiple times because it's really that interesting. And there's a lot of stuff back in there. One of the things that we found as a pattern was that there's, you know, we have these foundations in our country around the presidency, but there's also change to the presidency. And that's so many of our student questions around this. Um, and Jeff, I'm gonna toss this one to you first, is that when we look at change of the presidency over time, so many people want to wrap their brain around and understand executive orders. Um, so can you kind of dig us into what is, what is the founding story on executive orders? And that doesn't mean the founding era people. Um, and then what, what is, how has the presidency changed over time? Not just the clarity around the Second Amendment and two-term presidents or the 22nd Amendment and two-term presidency, but through executive orders. Great. Well, there are two really big and important questions. And let's first look at the numbers of executive orders. So George Washington issues eight executive orders. Um, then it goes down to kind of John Adams is one, Thomas Jefferson is four. It's really in that pretty low range for most of the 19th century. There's a huge surge. What, who do you think uh, is, is the president in the mid 19th century who issues more executive orders than anyone else? Well, it's Abraham Lincoln. It goes up to 48 during the Civil War because 
Congress is out of session and also Lincoln exercising his emergency powers thinks he has to act by executive order, although some of those are challenged as being unsupported by the congressional statutes that the Supreme Court has said are needed to justify an executive order. Then it goes uh, back down, um, surges for Ulysses S. Grant, 217 executive orders, back down into mere six for Garfield. We're kind of stable in the 150 range or something like that for the late 19th century. The biggest spike, bigger than anything since George Washington, Theodore Roosevelt issues 1,081 uh, executive orders. He's, why is that? He's the first progressive president. He insists that the president is a steward of the people who channels their will through his uh, unique status as the only official elected by the entire United States. And he's kind of questioning some of the separation of powers that the framers had taken for granted. We started off by saying the president has very few powers. Theodore Roosevelt says he has an unenumerated uh, penumbra of powers, um, and that led him to issue a lot of executive orders. Uh, Woodrow Wilson also issues 1,800 executive orders. He's in the same progressive tradition. So obviously the presidency has really changed around 19... Uh, 12, uh, which was the big election where Roosevelt and Wilson competed against William Howard Taft, our last constitutionalist president who issued far fewer executive orders. Then the next huge surge, and we're nearly done, uh, is of course Franklin Roosevelt, who during the New Deal issues 3,728 executive orders. The New Deal administrative state is up and running, and he's just ruling by executive order much more than any other president. Then it goes back down to uh, 900 for Harry Truman. And here's the really interesting thing. Um, it's been relatively consistent for the past couple of presidencies, 250 for Bill Clinton, 291 for George W. Bush, 276 for Barack Obama, 189 for President Trump in his uh, term so far. So uh, there we are. Um, I think I should stop, Curry, because we want to uh, end there, but we'll, we'll just say that we can use executive orders as a kind of stand-in for the increasingly unilateral presidency. The founders thought that Congress would pass laws and the president would just enforce them, starting with a little bit with Lincoln, but really with Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, presidents began to say that they could rule by executive order and uh, circumvent Congress as long as their orders weren't directly thwarting Congress's will. And that pattern has persisted among Democratic and Republican presidencies in the 21st century. A fascinating look at that change in executive orders over time uh, and, the, and the ups and downs of it as well. Just to clarify, was it 276 for Obama? Because I missed that it one. It was 276 for Obama. Yes, it was. Wow, great. That's really helpful. And um, it is, you know, spiking up and then going back down and trying to understand the kind of that seeing change of the presidency and defining the pre presidency different over time. When, uh, when uh, I know that when we look at the constitutional cases, that when the presidency makes an executive order that aligns with an agreement with Congress, it's a, is it, would you consider that a stronger executive order or one to be um, questioned less? Sorry, when the president is acting? With Congress, as, like in partnership with Congress with an executive order. Well, that's, yes, that's the crucial question. When are the executive orders consistent with the Constitution and when aren't they? And as your great question suggests, Curry, the Supreme Court has said that when the president acts with congressional support, when his executive orders are consistent with laws that Congress has passed, he acts at the zenith or height of his powers. When he acts in the face of congressional disapproval, his powers are at their lowest point or nadir. And when Congress hasn't clearly spoken, then he's in the zone of twilight, uh, which I always think of the twilight zone, that old show when I was a kid on TV, you can watch the reruns. Um, those three categories of the height, the lowest point in the zone of twilight come from the Youngstown shoot, uh, sheet and tube case. And it was Robert Jackson's concurring opinion. And he set forth those three categories, including the famous zone of twilight. And there were so many things there. I just wanted you to say zone of twilight. <laughs> <laughs> well, goal. Shall I do the music? <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> well, you know, you can have fun with constitutional 
conversations and yes. add creepy Twilight Zone music. And I knew Hollywood like it too. So I was like, I got to get into the Twilight. But it's a fascinating way to look at the founders wanted the branches to work together to be more successful. So it's a way to say when they work in partnership, doesn't mean they're unstoppable, but it does mean that they're more, there's more power in working together. Um, and so really helpful kind of laying out the role of the presidency, the change over time. And now, Holly, your first podcast on this is really uh, looking at the changes that we've seen at the White House, especially with the Rose Garden. So there's two final questions I have for you is, how have you seen change in the White House over time reflecting um, the change of the presidency too, and seeing like a, a part of that, it, it's DNA as well. Yeah, so we, you kind of alluded to this earlier, we tend to think of the White House as like this icon of our country's founding and thus we kind of get it stuck in our head as a static thing. But just as the constitution has been amended, so has the White House changed over time. And some of this was by necessity, right? When the White House was built, there was not electricity or running water. So <laughs> that would not have flown for uh, presidencies down the road. So that had to happen, but uh, there was always a plan for it to change. I mentioned before that the foundation actually changed right at the end before they, they laid it because two architects had been involved and they had different sizes laid out for how the, the footprint of the building would work. And George Washington had always envisioned a future of change at the White House. One of his provisions at the very beginning of the project was that it had to be built in such a way that it could later be expanded because he's kind of, I have to give him credit for a really long range view on this. He knew that the world was gonna change, that the needs of the presidency would change and that they would have to evolve the White House with it. A lot of presidents did a lot of renovations over the years. Theodore Roosevelt, it's not surprising to me that he made the most executive orders because he also probably made the most sweeping changes to the White House structure, including taking on a load bearing wall and um, they buttressed it, but it was not a good idea. Uh, this later came back to bite them because although not him, he was out of office. By the time Truman became president, they did one renovation, which was to add a balcony. And during that, it became apparent that if they didn't intervene quickly, the building was actually going to fall down um, because that is how much change had happened in the White House, even aside from the fire that Dolly Madison saved the painting from. Uh, it's always been a place that we have seen change, even though we tend to think of it as, like I said, more static. So it's really easy to worry and fret when we hear about a president making a change. Like I know a lot of people were chagrined about the Rose Garden being renovated, um, but this is really part of its history. It's not so much a desecration of history as the continuation of the ideas of it. We didn't even really have the historical society until Jackie Kennedy, who was like, hey, we should actually pay some attention and keep some records as to how this thing was decorated and how the rooms were laid out, et cetera. Uh, before that, everybody was kind of like, I wanted, this is my house now, I'm gonna decorate it how I want. And so now there are some, some stipulations in place, but it's still a place that's really about change just as our country is about change and evolution. So I think that's a fascinating way to wrap up. The only other thing I was gonna ask you about is this line you have in the podcast about the president's house being the first work from home space ever. Yes. <laughs> they really think about it, guys. When we think about the president's house, the reason why we think so deeply about it and hold it as our own so much is that it isn't just where the president lives, it's where the president and the executive branch do their work. So you have the West Wing, you have a press talks from the Rose Garden, like all these iconic spaces that you see as the leadership of our country. But I think understanding how the presidency has changed over time, along with how the actual White House and the work of the presidency and the place of the presidency has changed over time is a fascinating way to wrap this together. Thank you guys so much. Jeff, do you have any final words for us wrapping up this Friday fun day session? Uh, thank you so much for learning about the constitution. Thank you, Holly. So exciting to learn about the White House. It makes it so real. Can't wait to hear your podcast. And uh, thanks for sharing all your wisdom with our, with our great friends. Oh, thank you so much. I could listen to you talk about the constitution all day. So Likewise. mutual admiration. Wonderful. So thank you guys so much. I will hang out afterwards if you have any follow-up questions. I just put a bunch of links in the chat for you to check out the White House Historical Society, check out the podcast and the interactive constitution. Thank you so much, Holly Fry, for doing this. Check out Stuff You Miss in History class 
And thank you, Jeff Rosen, for guiding us through the Constitution, doing our constitutional walkabout today for the presidency. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Have a good weekend. See you next time in class.